Hello, welcome to this week's edition of the Turning Points Podcast. We had uh, an amazing conversation with the lovely Sarah McLean from Santa Barbara, California. Um, she is a meditation teacher, coach, uh, author. Did she write a Oh, yeah. She's written a couple of books. Hay House bestselling author on meditation. And uh, yeah, she is the founding founder of the McLean Meditation Institute. And she actually teaches people how to teach meditation. She also runs a website called Feast for the Soul, which is supportive of uh, all things meditation. And I will link, of course, everything. I've known Sarah for 25 years. We have a very similar path and I just respect her greatly. And it was a fun conversation. We had a great time. Sean said he was totally high after she hung up just a few minutes ago. Yeah, I was. Uh, it was almost like a mini uh, meditation uh, training, to be honest. There was a lot of great uh, grounding exercises. So uh, if that doesn't get you uh, excited to go learn meditation or learn how to teach meditation, I don't know what will. So <laughs> enjoy the uh, conversation for sure. Hey, Sarah, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm good, man. Every Monday we look uh, we look forward to this time uh, where we kind of get to recap the week, uh, look ahead, and then uh, obviously have a great conversation with each guest. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited for this podcast. I'm excited. I love Corinne. I love you. And I like to be interviewed by meditators. Oh, heck yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure we'll uh, we'll have plenty of questions for you because uh, we'll get into why you love talking to meditators. <laughs> Um, but I want to kick the uh, conversation off with the kind of the initial question that uh, the podcast was designed around, which is um, when in your past do you remember spiritual turning points when your programming, uh, either your childhood programming or your social programming, no longer worked for you um, or, or you decided to get on a spiritual seeking path? That is such a great question. I mean, I love I love these pivotal moments in in one's life, mine included, obviously. Um, I can remember, gosh, I can remember not drinking the Kool Aid pretty much my whole life. I remember feeling very connected to nature and animals, and I just felt very disconnected from human beings. And so, I've always kind of looked for. Um, depth of relationship within the world around me. And, um, but the thing was, I was really focused on the world around me. I kind of wrote off humans. I had a very, kind of a challenging family life and I kind of wrote them off. Not, I didn't dislike them. I just didn't find what I, I didn't find that nourishment there. And so, like I said, I came up with that alternative reality and a lot of it was, um, reading a lot of mystery stories. I used to like to read mysteries and get to the bottom of things. And as I got a little older, I got very excited about, now this is going to date me, uh, I got very excited about the Time Life series on, um, there was on pyramids and it was on um, these sort of UFOs and psychic phenomenon. And I was like, wow, maybe that's the answer. Because I always knew there was something more than met the eye, but I didn't know what it was, whether it's magic or mystery Unfortunately, in my life, my both my parents were of a different uh, religious sort of path. So every Sunday was filled with lots of fighting before they <laughs> got to decide which person was going to go to church, which one I was going to go to church with. And um, and I really found I didn't I didn't have a touchstone, a base inside of me yet. And that's where the turning point comes in. I was. Um, I didn't kind of follow the rules. I basically was a rebel. I dropped out of high school, joined the military, wanted to be a spy to keep on <laughs> with the mysteries of everything. And then one day, um, as I, I didn't get to be a spy, I ended up working with the mind, which is, as you probably know, a big mystery. And I was sitting outside of a psychiatric hospital. I was training to work with soldiers who were suffering from PTSD. Oh. And that's where some of them ended up, really, to be honest, back then in the 80s. And um, as we were prepared to go in, the male nurse that was in charge of our particular platoon guided us into a body scan practice as we were lying on the, on the grass outside of the psychiatric hospital. I'd never done anything like it. I did used to pretend I meditated when I was in... Um, um, skipping school <laughs> and taking the subway into Boston where I grew up into Cambridge actually 
And, but yet I've never really done it. Um, and I was lying on this yard outside the psych ward and um, he was guiding us through a body awareness practice. And I remember having the thought, this is such a contrast between how I normally feel. And I think that was a turning point for me. I, I, I could say that my life changed completely from then, but it didn't. But what stuck with me was the contrast for how relaxed I felt after the 10 minutes of a body scan lying on this yard. And then how I felt what my norm was before that. Really tense, really stressed, really reactionary, I'd have to say. So fast forward, that was in the 80s, fast forward to uh, late 80s, and I realized at this point I was always looking for sort of connection outside of myself, whether it was nature, a book, um, you know, a pyramid. And at that point, I was looking for it in love, right? And so I was looking for whatever's going to make me feel better out there. And I met this guy And um, I immediately felt an attraction for him. And he did to me. And he said, look, if you really want to be my girlfriend, you're going to have to learn to meditate. (laughs) And uh, I did. And I did. But I'd do anything for love at that point. I was still looking to feel this place called home. And romance was definitely a part of it, but it wasn't it. And because, as you know, it can be turbulent when you outsource your sense of home and happiness, for sure. So I ended up, um, I ended up learning to meditate because I would do anything to get rid of the anxiety that I felt. I mean, I was it was terrible. It was just overwhelming. I learned to meditate, and I read this book called Perfect Health. Actually, I think I was reading Quantum Healing or Creating Health because it was in 1989. And in that book, it was by Deepak Chopra. In the back of the book, it says, "If you want to learn more about." these alternative or complementary ways of healing call this number. The alternative ways of healing were meditation, yoga, daily routine, organize your daily routine around the rhythms of nature, taste, um, you know, the various tastes that you could use to change your body, um, color therapy, massage, elimination therapy, and even paying attention to your astrological um, rhythms. And I wanted it. I wanted it all in one big package. I didn't want to go just to yoga or just to aromatherapy. So I signed up. But that moment when I learned to meditate, when that fellow, we'll just call him Joe, um, (laughs) asked me to to learn, I remember sitting there in this uh, three-story brownstone in Washington, D.C., where I was a real estate agent at the time. I just bicycled around the world looking for the secrets of success with another boyfriend um, and I got home and I was sitting in this um, uh, this room with this man in a leisure suit. I don't know if you know what a leisure suit is, I but do. it is a plastic suit that people used to wear that looked like a regular suit <laughs> made out of polyester. And he um, gave me what he called a mantra. I didn't know what it was, but he gave me a word. I was to silently think to myself. And I sat and silently think that word to myself. And I didn't know what was happening. I had no sort of preconceived notions. And after about 20 minutes, I opened my eyes. But it wasn't just that I opened my eyes. When I came out of the meditation, I felt like I had come home. Mm -hmm. I felt the, I felt so at home, both sitting with my eyes closed and then with my eyes open and hearing the birds singing feeling this relaxation similar to that time on the, on the yard and, you know, being in this moment in this room with this man. And I knew at that point, my life was going to change. And that was definitely the turning point. And you know, it's really all about contrasts, whether it's the contrast of being totally stressed out or totally relaxed or that contrast of being um, outsourcing my happiness or resourcing it inside these contrasts were were so irrefutable, really, in my experience. So that began um, a whole journey 30 years ago, at least at this point, um, where I've, my life has been on a different tra- trajectory, for sure. That's a Man. long answer to a short question. 
No, I mean that. Well, that there's a lot of uh, synchronicities in in many people's answers. You know, the 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 landscape of becoming a seeker or discovering you are a seeker or however you want to put that. You know, the landscape in people's lives are different, but you know, there there's a there's a lot of similarities. And um, Roger, I was listening back to a, a podcast that we did with Roger, and and you know, he said, I think we're all born a seeker. Um, we all may not know that. Um, and, and that's what I think the most, the most resistance in the early, you know, days of our lives, I think comes, comes from, like you said, you you were very rebellious, you know, and you, you went against, you know, your parent, I'm sure your parents law and, you know, social norms and, and it's unfortunate because I'm sure you weren't a bad person kid i'm sure you weren't a you know bad teenager i'm sure you acted out i'm sure you acted badly but but when you're not getting what's serving you and you don't know how to look for it right th- there's there's just frustration and anger and so you know i i think that's i think it's i think it's good to showcase like yeah i was rebellious and now you are uh among many things a meditation coach and teacher and you know and and i right. think I'm sure at an early age, your parents would have been like, yeah, she's definitely going to turn out to be a meditation teacher when you were, you know, in high school. But I, I, I want to showcase one thing when you said things can get turbulent when you outsource your home, your sense of home. That is yeah. a beautiful way of putting that in, in all degrees. And, um, sorry, I, I had to, I had to expand upon, cause like that was a very, that was all very beautiful, even though it was uh, lengthy to get to that point. Um, I want to go back in that first time you meditated uh, or really had the body scan experience. Um, and you said it didn't really change your life completely, but, but was it, was it a moment where you where some programming might've been let, let go of, or was it something you could hang on to for a while afterwards? That moment. Well, that I still hang on to it in terms of when I, you know, a lot of us do that recapitulation and say, okay, how did I get here? How did I get right here? And, yeah. you know, trying to, it doesn't make sense as we're going through our forward, but when 2020 in the rear view mirror for sure. And, and I look back to my first meditation experiences, you know, the very first one was, was probably real. And I was a kid who knows, but you know, the other one where pretending in the back of the subway but then having that experience, there was nothing odd about it. We were just, I mean, you could think it was odd. I'm in a military uniform lying down with a male nurse t- telling me to relax my body. But that <laughs> that was such a, I think that planted a seed. I think yeah. the seed maybe was there that maybe watered it a little bit. Because when I look back, that was definitely um, a touchstone, a turning point. Another one that was interesting um, was between those two experiences of meditation. I was, I did finally get my GED. I did finally get out of the army after being married and divorced. And then I went to to college and I graduated there. But on my journey in college, I was, um, I pulled a piece of paper off the wall that said, learn to meditate. And I pulled that off the wall when I went to visit this woman. I went to school in Amherst, Massachusetts. And I went to this woman's um, room and she had a big pyramid strapped to the ceiling. And uh, she had me sitting on her bed, you know, cross-legged. And then she guided me into a practice that she wanted me to do on my own. And it was so complicated. And I'm not particularly visual. Uh, They call that aphantasia, I think, where you cannot see if someone tells Mm -hmm. you to imagine a a blue elephant. And um, so I couldn't do the practice she was teaching me. And though that wasn't a turning point now for me, I mean, then for me, it it has been because it's a memory I had of being so extremely frustrated, wanting something that I'd heard it was good for me. And I knew I had overwhelming anxiety, but there I was getting taught by a woman who just made it so uber complicated. So looking back, that has really informed my teaching that you don't have to be able to, you know, imagine a chakra if you don't even know what one is. And I didn't. Um, you don't have to do sit under a, um, you know, a pyramid strap from the ceiling. You know, you don't have to do this stuff. But I thought that was it. And then yeah. there I was on the ground, innocently doing it. And that had more potency. Well, yeah, Tony Robbins, a big thing is that he, he says, you know, as human beings, we're physiological beings and we are 
constantly going towards pleasure and away from pain, but we're actually more motivated by the avoidance of pain than we are pleasure. And so for you, that was a painful, uncomfortable, confusing experience. So that stuck out in your mind to make you a great teacher. Cause that's what, that's what, um, I don't know who, but this is what we say when we teach people how to meditate is you want to encourage the people you teach how to meditate, not to teach others until they actually take a training because you can give them an off experience. If you give somebody else your mantra or you try to teach, try to remember what your meditation teacher told you, you know, you're giving them a very watered down experience. And then they're like, oh, I can't do it. I don't want to do it anymore. So it's definitely an important, important point. It's it's like you're a midwife in a way as a meditation teacher. And I do have to Let's just put it this way. I've had to write some of the uh, misinformation that people have gotten and they've been holding on to for 20 or 30 years before they dare try to meditate again because they heard about it on Dr. Oz or something. You know, they're ready again, but they've been so uh, misinstructed initially um, that we've had to go back and help a lot of people. One woman came to me and said, you know, my meditation teacher, you know, when I was in college said, I don't have what it takes to meditate. (laughs) <laughs> now that is a big deal because wow. imagine you're being told by someone who's got some authority yeah. that you don't have what it takes. She, and just for those of you listening right now, I've never met anyone who doesn't have what it takes. Everybody has what it takes. You have the only people that have not been able to meditate are people who have cognitive decline in a severe way or, yeah. um, you know, some sort of challenge cognitively, but in general, Having too many thoughts is not a cognitive challenge. It may seem like it, (laughs) but I've taught people that are uber type A and they can still meditate. Absolutely. Um, So for those of you listening, you have what it takes. Everybody does. It's your birthright to be able to meditate and you don't have to outsource it to anyone. You know, really and truly, once you learn how to do it, you need nothing. You need nothing. You've got it all. That's what I love about it. I'm glad, so glad you said that because, uh, you know, I get, I get whenever, you know, those before COVID we used to have, you know, LA has a big one. Nashville does too. Those, those, um, health and wellness expos, those, those cosmic, I don't know what they're called, but I get anxiety when I walk into this. If you pay $400 and buy this machine, you will be enlightened. And if you can read your chakras and there's just like so much out there, it can be so confusing for people. Yeah. Um, but yet again, that's kind of part of the path. It's part of sometimes being confused is part of it. I'm just grateful for myself that I was able to find meditation early on and have that discerning um, intuition within myself because of the meditation to be, I feel like I was on the Learjet path um, a lot of times because of the clarity that the meditation brought me. Right. And, you know, just for those of you who don't meditate yet out there, there are a lot of brands that will tell you that's the only way to do it. There's a lot of headgear that you can wear that's going to get you to where you want to go. You know, I, I don't say don't do it, but I'd say, you know, try it. But if if you are, if someone's coming to you and you know they're financially motivated uh, because you take their training and no one else's, then it's probably, like I say, not necessary, not necessary because you have everything it takes to meditate. All you really need is a good little bit of good instruction. You don't need any accoutrements. You don't need any beads. You don't need to change your religion. You don't need to wear anything. You don't special. You don't have to. Um, you don't have to change a thing except for maybe your daily routine to include a couple of minutes of meditation when you first wake up. And then a couple of minutes of meditation if you want to go on the Learjet path, like Corinne was saying. Um, after you get home from work, if you are working around happy hour, whatever you do to relax, meditate first. Having said that, and you're so humble, you're humble, but you're also, I mean, you're very open about there being many paths because you've studied many paths. I do want to say, I mean, we'll probably say this at the end too, but your meditation teacher training is phenomenal. Um, yeah, it really is. You are born to do it. And, um, I love sending people your way. I always thought, you know, having done the yoga teacher training, I thought, and loving meditation so much, I always thought I would love to develop a program until I saw Sarah's program. And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't need to. (laughs) Sarah has got this. I will just send people to her. So, okay. 
Okay. Well, and it, and it seems like, uh, sorry, I got to elaborate because I, I haven't taken your teacher training um, and I have never meditated with you, but the way you are describing the relationship one has with their meditative practice, it it is about taking time for focused awareness. Yeah. And, and it sounds like that's what was so profound for you laying in the grass was perhaps that was the first time somebody brought you into that space of focused awareness right. and the contrast between how you lived before that point and, and that, that moment where you're like, so well, it might be a little weird. We're laying in grass and, you know, army, you know, garb, but, but one thing that Corinne and I kind of, this uh, common thread that we said, you know, awareness trumps everything. Awareness trumps it all. And, and, and it sounds like you're very open to whatever method somebody does want to try or use but ultimately, you know that unless that method is bringing you to that focused awareness, it's not going to give you any more than that experience of focused awareness. Well, there's only so many ways you can meditate. You know, yeah. there's only so many ways. So you're right. So I always say there are three ingredients to meditation. The first is your willingness to do it. Right. The second is your non judgmental, gentle attention, what is now called mindful awareness, you know, sort of that unencumbered ability to stay present. And everybody's got that. It's what you might gaze at a night sky with or a candle flame with. And then the third ingredient is what you focus on in the meditation. You call it focused attention practice. There are other kinds that don't have that third ingredient, which are a little more advanced. But, um, you know, I went after I started working for Deepak Chopra, after I got that book, it was in a transcendental meditation community. Corinne and I have this in common. And we went and got the advanced techniques and we were both presidents of the classes of the advanced techniques. And then I left um, after eight years of working with Deepak, I ended up moving to India and then studying and living. I studied with the Dalai Lama there and his head monks and taught English to some of the nuns there. That was his charge, really. He gave these nuns is to learn to speak English. So they could then go on and share their experience and their religion, really. And then I went to an ashram, so did Corinne, with a guru and kind of lived that lifestyle there for a while and um, came back home. And I couldn't, I, I, before all of this, I was a real estate agent. And one of the things in real estate is when you're showing a house is to remove all obstacles to someone liking that house, whether you remove the family pictures or some particular weird taste is to remove all obstacles. So I learned that a little bit, um, but, and I'm gonna tell you, so I, I went to the guru's place and then I came back and I wanted to go back into my real life, but I just couldn't. It just, it didn't make any sense to me. I remember landing in New York City. Here's another turning point. I was landed in New York City and I was, I had had my shoes stolen in, in in India. I don't know. You take your shoes off to go to temples. I had no shoes, just a pair of flip-flops, and it was December. So <laughs> I was looking for a place to buy some shoes. And if you've ever been shoe shopping in New York City, there's one particular street that all it is is shoes. Bleaker. And it was so overwhelming to my senses. Instantly, um, I had this thought, I have to make some money. And it wasn't just I have to make some money. It was like this feeling inside of my whole, everything I had found to be important as I was gone, had gone away and been in that world for years and years changed. I immediately thought I need to make some money. I was about to sell my soul so I could buy some shoes. It was Mm -hmm. the weirdest feeling in the world. And I started to get anxiety and I started to think about, oh, I need to get a high paying job so I can do this. And all of a sudden, it was like I somebody slapped me in the face and I said, nope, I'm going to go move into a monastery. So I moved into a Zen Buddhist monastery and I became a resident there for two years where you don't really need shoes and <laughs> um, became the cook there. So I had really done a survey of Tibetan Buddhist practices, of Zen Buddhist practices, of the Transcendental Meditation Group, of living in an ashram life in India And so I was able to, at the Zen Center for um, many years, um, just really dive into that presence. But I still had my stuff. I still had stuff. It doesn't magically go away. 
But like you said, the key is awareness, self-awareness being the main key. You know, is this feel, does this feel nourishing to me? Does this feel toxic to me? How am I responding to the impulse to share? How am I responding to my emotions? How am I responding to the, what uh, seems like the other person out there? So I lived there for a couple of years and then I got a phone call from a man named Gary Zukoff and um, he was kind of famous there on uh, Oprah Winfrey had been on 50 times or something. And he had a different practice that he was sort of inviting people to do. He called me and he asked me if I would help him. He had heard about me working with Deepak and Debbie Ford, who we didn't even mention here at this point, but um, I went to work for him and I got another type of practice that I'd only dabbled with in the Zen Center because they had it too, is sitting in community and sitting in circles and um, sitting there and really being present with the fluctuations of the mind and the fluctuations of the emotions and really uh, staying very present, not leaving myself. This became very, very important not to leave myself because even though I had learned that meditation is a great way to come home, sometimes with my eyes open, I would kind of leave myself to please somebody else or to get love or to whatever it may be. I kind of put myself aside. And um, so I learned not to leave myself as I sat in these circles. It's called a council practice. And it was a really potent integrative practice for me because I was fine in meditation but the minute I opened my eyes I would give myself away uh, whether it was my opinion or my sense of self or just about anything wow. and um, yeah that was a really important step for me is to sit there and do that that I that's a very very valuable thing to to put out there for you know anybody who who is struggling with that, you know, to me, it's this like stretching experience of like, you know, you're in meditation, it's like a safe zone. And then as soon as, like you said, you know, you, for you, it was opening your eyes, almost immediately you started to give yourself away. And I think for some people, maybe it, maybe it takes longer, you know, and, and that's, that's been my experience. Um, you know, I, that's something I'm, I'm working on, you know, very focused right now is kind of the, the money issue thing or the, the, um, what do we call it? It's empathy that is over over empathetic. You know, as soon as I'm in a in an old environment with old programming, it it draws that old programming out of me, and I become that old thing that doesn't that doesn't serve me. You know, and I think that's uh, it's good to differentiate between programming and spiritual practice. There are th certain things that are innate to us, natures about who we are, that that do serve us. There's there's things about ourselves that serve us in our life. We don't necessarily want to get rid of everything, but those are the things I think you discover through meditation is what's what's true and what's innate versus what's what that programming like. Oh, I need to make money to go buy shoes. Is that going to serve you? You know, and having that discernment is is a huge. You know, that's a huge valuable thing, but I'm glad you put that out there of it isn't an immediate right away thing that, okay, now I meditate. Now I'm not going to have those issues. You really just become more aware of that dance through life. You know, you, you, you're aware of that, that play between the inner world, the spiritual world, the re, you know, real world, the non-real world, They're like all this thing is just kind of, you know, more presence, more present to that. Yeah. And, and, you know, at some point, I mean, that's what enlightenment is, isn't it? You are enlightened, lighting up all those crevices, all those mental tendencies, all those negative beliefs, all those erroneous beliefs about yourself and the world and your place in it. And I mean, that the more we meditate and it as a gradual experience, meditation will take you there. But I had to start incorporating more mindful living uh, because I had been so checked out for so long. And I was on another call uh, podcast earlier today. And, you know, I say sometimes when people tend to be checked out, if they're, you know, having challenges with alcohol or drugs, meditation is great because they're trying to escape anyway. And meditation, I find a lot of people who have addictive tendencies love to meditate and they may be the ones that head off to a monastery. And so 
what happens is the time when you're not meditating and you're living can be the biggest challenge and not you're not quite caught up in it. So I needed some more skills like don't leave myself, be kind to myself, treat myself as a, you know a, a worthy human being, get to know who I really am outside of the roles I play, the positions I hold and the responsibilities I hold. And so I that was really working with him even though that was a very challenging time in my life to leave the the monastery and then move there uh, for various reasons, which I will not get into. However, I want to <laughs> talk about some of the, the reasons um, in a general sense. You know, as I learned in, in Buddhism, whether it's Zen Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism, and they're very, very different practices, is um, they talk about, you know, suffering, the four noble truths. And you might've heard this in some way, shape or form, but the first is, you know, life is suffering. All life is suffering, which if you think about it is a nightmare to think about. So it's like, okay, well, I don't want that. I mean, your limbic system's like, uh, that's a no. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm going to move away from it, which is why people get into various addictive behaviors. But Buddhism would say life is suffering. Suffering, this is second um, truth. Suffering is caused by clinging to your desires or resisting what is going on. Okay, so that is uh, interesting to think about clinging to your desires. So what I immediately did was I put a bumper sticker on my car that said, it's all good. Anytime anyone asked me if I needed anything, I'd be like, no, I'm good. I pretended like I was better than I was, which is an affront to anyone who does that to themselves. I was not being kind to myself by pretending I was happy when I wasn't. I had just been diagnosed with cancer. I had had a terrible breakup. You know, I mean, just because we meditate doesn't make everything great. Mm. However, um, the third truth is that there's a way out of suffering. And the next is to know your true nature. To know your true nature. Now, that sounds like maybe some weird spiritual stuff, but really what it boils down to is asking yourself the question, who is it that's looking through my eyes? You know, who am I outside of this? Or some people would call it an earth suit. Actually, Gary would call it an earth suit. Who <laughs> am I outside of this earth suit? Who am I outside of being this age, this weight, this hair color, this race, this gender, or this... Uh, yeah, the sexual orientation, this religion, these roles, these uh, letters and numbers after my name, you know, getting to know that, that's looking through your eyes, getting to know that consciousness that um, is living through you as you. So this became another pursuit for me is to, to know my true nature. Even though I had lived in a monastery, I had no idea what they were talking about. And another aspect that I found to be essential, which was a problem after I left the monastery and all the other communities I was in was community was so important to me. And as you'll find in various traditions, they say there are three jewels. Again, this is a Buddhist concept, but it's very real in every sort of successful spiritual practice that you might end up getting engaged in. First, they say one of the jewels is your the wisdom wherever you get it whether it's from this podcast or from the bible or from ancient poetry from rumi or from time life magazine and reading about the ancients uh egyptians it doesn't matter where you get it but that you get wisdom from a teacher living or dead or some some time time tested knowledge second jewel is your practice whatever connects you to that deepest part of you. Now that is called the Buddha. So the first, the knowledge is called the Dharma. The Dharma is knowledge, wherever you get it. The Upanishads, the Buddha is whatever connects you to the deepest part of you, to that true nature. And it doesn't have to be meditation. It can be dance, poetry, gardening, um, prayer. But whatever connects you to that unencumbered part of you, that limitless part of you, and then third is the community of, of practice. So I know that many of us have a set of friends. We probably have a set of family members. And we have neighbors, 
right? Those are all circles of influence, spheres of influence and support systems. But when we get down and dirty with our spiritual practice, we have to create what's called a sangha, sangha, a community of practice. That was what was missing for me after I left the monastic setting. I went to work for us with a single guy. Uh, he had a girlfriend and it was just me and I had a boyfriend, but I didn't have a community that held me the way I needed it. And uh, I could feel that made me a little rudderless. Now, again, as I say, this community of practice is not always your family. It is not always your the existing friends that you have or friends you'll make. A community of practice is a group of people, whether they're virtual or whether they're in 3D, that you practice with. And you never have to be this agreeing on anything. You could be voting differently. You could be religiously different. But it's a practice community that you're kind of looking at what's important in the same way in terms of your own self-awareness. And then, so that was missing for me. And then I left, uh, after a couple, a year and a half, I left working with him and ended up working with a great spiritual teacher who kind of, I'd like to say, took me home in some way, although my practice does that. She took me further along. And this woman was named Byron Katie. Some of you know her. She does the work of Byron Katie, which really helped to unravel the various beliefs that I had about myself that I had never questioned. And maybe you've got some or some of the listeners have them. Things like, I'm not lovable. Not really. There's something pretty wrong with me deep down. Um, There's not enough in this world for me and you. Um, Some of my beliefs came from my mother. I thought love was finite. Mm -hmm. I thought if I loved you, and I'm still struggling with this today, if I love you and I love my cat, well, that, and then I find another friend, I'm only going to have so much love and somebody's going to take some of it away. Like success, I thought was finite. And I, you know, I, what I realize as I go deeper into practice, I've been into meditation for over 30 years now, there's enough, there's enough and there's more than enough. And um, my loving you does not take away from my loving my husband or my dog or my community or my mother. There's enough. And I had to come, I had some belief systems around that. And so Byron Katie really suggests that you question whatever beliefs and thoughts cause you suffering, like I'm not lovable, whatever that may be. So that really works. And she does it through some inquiry practice that I'm not going to go into now, but if you want to know more, you can go to her website, the T H E work W O R K dot org. Honestly, it's all free on there. You can figure out what I'm talking about. If you have meditated your life away and you're still dealing with, I'm not lovable. That really helped me a lot. So years later, I've been still meditating. And um, I came, because as a teacher of meditation, and I know Corinne probably talks about this too, we have to talk about the quality of attention that you give to your practice, whether you're saying a mantra or you're doing a body scan or you're doing a gratitude practice. You know, there's three ingredients to any meditation, right? There's your willingness, there's your attention, there's a focus for your attention, that's it. And the attention has to be that mindful attention. So at some point we have to talk about that attention and what is meditation? Well, ultimately it's you and your attention focused on an object and at some point throughout the practice, the difference between the two or the duality dissipates and then it's almost as if there's a fusion between subject object the subject object split disappears not because you think about it not because you will it but because of the practice and as that disappears all that's basically left is what some people might call thusness or consciousness undifferentiated you know so that's the cool part it's always, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a mystery girl. I like to get into the mystery of light, of love, 
of what's looking through my eyes, what's going on behind your eyes. I'm into it. Now I know why you've created um, McLean Meditation Institute. That's your that's your community that you were missing. <laughs> your own built-in one. I had to. I had to. And, you know, I just moved here to Santa Barbara where it's super califragilistic, even though I, I've been traveling so much the first year I got here. And then I... Um, been in lockdown the second year I've been here. But fortunately, we created some online communities through yeah. teaching, through my alone together meditations, and now the Feast for the Soul meditations, where, you know, there's so much stress and uh, I have to say collateral damage from the social distancing that is causing people to come face to face with all their belief systems about themselves and their self limiting beliefs. And uh, so I want to help them find that comfort because they are already physically home, uh, find that comfort uh, in being home here. So are you still doing, sorry, Sean, just one thing. Are you still doing um, your, your meditations where you guide people in meditation every day? We are, I done, I did it for nine months, which is funny. It, It was from March till December. And then we stopped December 1st. We're taking a little break. Um, and then we're going to get re-engaged with daily meditations on January 15th. Okay. And, and that's called the Feast for the Soul. And it's available. It's actually evergreen. You can go on anytime. A-S-T, feastforthesoul.org. Feastforthesoul.org is a spiritual practice period. And I was just thinking about this this morning. It was founded by a woman who was a Sufi. And she was reading a Rumi poem. And the Rumi poem said, what nine months does for a growing embryo, 40 early mornings will do for your growing awareness. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a beautiful poem by Rumi. And she was so motivated by that, that she created a Sangha, a community of practice. And it was little pods of people all over the country, all over the world it ended up being, where everybody was kind of practicing every early morning for 40 days. And then she invited faculty members to record these meditations, and I was one of them. And um, she eventually got pretty sick and hired me as the um, director, which is an unpaid position of a lot of work. And so our, I hire the, I get faculty members to come and donate their meditations, and we're starting that live again for 40 days. Because if you can really make that commitment to meditation. It will change your life. And no, it doesn't make it perfect. But yes, it'll make it a whole lot more comfortable and a whole lot more fulfilling and a whole lot more um, loving, I'd have to say. You feel much more connected to yourself, the world around you, and maybe your the people around you, whether they meditate or not. I like how Deepak explains it, the GPS. I, I remember uh, being in a workshop with him in the, must have been in the 90s, maybe in 2000. And he was like, um, they're coming out with this internet soon that the government has, it's connecting everything. And there's the, also, I've seen this new contraption called a, a GPS. And you're going to be able to plug in the address to where you want to go. And through satellite, it'll it'll tell you where to go. I remember him explaining this. And he said, your consciousness is the, is the same way. You just put in where you want to go and it'll reroute you and take you. It'll, if there's, you know, if you decide to not listen and you go one way, it'll end up rerouting you just like a GPS. Doesn't matter if you follow <laughs> the GPS or if there's a car accident or if you stop, the GPS will pick it up from wherever you are. And that's how I love to think about meditation uh, plugs you into that direct GPS that will get you there in the most efficient you know, flowing, you know, doesn't mean you're not going to have pain and it won't have difficulties, but there, there, will, there's a sense of, um, it's like, it's like your lifeline and, and your connection. Um, and there's a, there's just a piece to that, a piece finally that you didn't have before. That's what I had when I first started meditating is I got this sense of inner peace immediately. I didn't know I didn't have inner peace. I didn't know I wanted inner peace, but I got it afterwards and I only recognized it afterwards. That's what I actually wanted to go back to you. And then Sean, jump in with your question. Oh, go go ahead. Can I just say something? Now you can call it a PGS. Uh, Instead of a GPS, it's a PGS, personal guidance system. Yeah. Yes, nice. Nice. So that time when you learned how to meditate with actual instruction after your boyfriend told you to learn, um, 
did you want to be a meditation teacher right then? And what was your immediate? Okay. Not then yet. Okay. No, I, I mean, I didn't even know I was a teacher. I was so scared to speak in public, you know, really and truly. I, I really would never put myself out there for the reasons I was saying, you know, I gave you some of my internal dialogue, but the other parts where I'm fat and ugly, no one will listen to me. I'm not smart enough, you know, all that stuff. And, um, so no, I didn't want to be a teacher. I just was like, I wanted to be loved. So I sat there and meditated with him. I ended up moving in with him and meditating with him. And he had that book that I had already read the book review about. And in the back of the book, I finally read the book. In the back of the book, it says, if you want to know more, call this number. And I called that number. And it was at the Maharishi Ayurveda Health Center, a transcendental meditation community in Massachusetts, where I was originally from. So I I asked, do you need any help? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, what do you need? And he goes, well, we just need some people to answer the phone. And because that was becoming popular, you know, um, because he was just on the forefront of alternative or complementary practices, which up until that point, you know, people who had cancer, their job was to get chemo and radiation. And if you had Parkinson's, you take this medication. And he was kind of tapping into sort of this um underserved or unserved population of people who knew that what they paid attention to had a direct effect on their bodies. And that's Deepak and, Chopra um, you're talking about. Yeah, Deepak Chopra. And so yeah. I ended up uh, getting in my car, packing all my stuff, leaving my boyfriend behind and heading up there because suddenly my spirituality was more important than anything else. Mm. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I didn't know it was a one-way like life, you're just going one direction. Uh, you can't go backwards. And I didn't realize it, but it was the best decision I ever made. And like you, I constantly am choosing, if with any luck, uh, sort of the evolutionary path. Now, I like the um, the analogy of a labyrinth. Have you ever walked a labyrinth? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like you go in and you're supposed to feel a certain way. You don't have to go in that way. You just go in. And you pay attention as you move around, but you'll notice in some moments you're way on the outside and then you're way on the inside, really close to the middle. But if you're paying attention and following the path, you can't get there. You have to go back out to the outside and then you come back in. It's a great analogy for one's spiritual path and one's path of evolution is sometimes you feel like you got it. And then you find yourself way on the outside so far from the center. <laughs> then you keep going. You finally get in the middle. And that's really, um, that's the spiritual life. And you're always moving towards evolution. Always and always. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. I, I think it's important to to kind of talk about those, tra- I call them traumas or those beliefs that you hold that that are uh, inhibiting you from moving through or towards your, your true self or to, to that spiritual gravity that is drawing you to, to make this crazy random decision to go in a direction that you have no reason to believe will work out or whatever, you know, there's our, our spiritual practice, whatever that is for many of us, it's meditation. That meditation keeps you in the the space where you're questioning those beliefs. Like you said, you know, Byron Katie is question those beliefs question. Is this true for me? And, and, and I hope that our culture and society through, you know, podcasts like this, through work that you do through conversations that, you know, Corinne and I have through, you know, everything we do, I, I'm, I'm hoping that our society starts realizing how, how monumental, a belief like your love is limited can be for, for a child, you know, and it, we have to be very vigilant in having our own spiritual practice while we're raising our kids or while we're interacting with anybody on a, you know, perhaps a younger quote unquote, younger spiritual practice, because like you said, I mean, it's very damaging when you tell somebody, Oh, you're not cut out for meditation or that, you know, these, these traumas that exist in our programming, they, they're almost, they're so big and they're to our brain, they're more attractive than the spiritual practice. And that's why they're limiting is because we're attracted to this 
belief that is actually limited, right? You know, the limiting belief of your love is, you know, finite. The limiting belief of whatever, you know, for me, it's I'm not good enough or I will never be good enough. It, we just get fixated on that. We become more attracted to that than our spiritual self and our, our true self and our, you know, spiritual path. And it also feels like, uh, I'd have to say, sometimes if the ripple effect of a thought like that and unquestioning it, just say, well, that's obviously true. I'm going to just believe that. But really looking deeply into the ripple effect, what behaviors do you take on when you believe that you're not good enough? What ways do you walk into a room when you feel you're not good enough? How do you treat yourself when you believe that? How do you treat other people? How do you treat inanimate objects, you know? When you believe you're not good enough, what choices do you make? It has right. it's so insidious. And to, to un, not question it is, um, I think that's how many people live. I know that right now during this pandemic, a lot of people are refining their, refining their lives and really taking a look at what's nourishing and what's not and getting rid of stuff in their house. And I know that people are really seeing themselves because they can't escape themselves. But I also know that... Um, it's a real challenging time. And, and I'm so grateful that I have meditation during this time. It I believe that when we look back at this time, we're going to have a lot of silver linings. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But it doesn't feel that way right now. This is definitely a turning point. I know this is called turning point, but this is a turning point for the, the world. And maybe um, helping people get more responsible for their health and their happiness their sense of contentment and home. Uh, maybe they're maybe looking outside ourselves for the news is not going to be as uh, charming, maybe as looking inside of ourselves for the news. Well, Who knows? yeah, I, that's such a, it's a great point. Uh, and, and, for me, what's been going on is even because I'm here alone at, at Ivy House, there's nobody here. And so for me, it's just being with anything that comes up. It's like, how many times do we distract ourselves with Netflix and social media and going out with a friend or if we live with someone with dealing with their problem? It's like there, there's just so many distractions in the world. And this is hopefully forcing well, forcing people to look inward and realize what's going on inside um, at the deepest level, at the deepest level. I, I, I see many, so there's been many silver linings for me personally. And most of the people I talk to as well, of course, a lot of pain. Um, but we, you know, we do, as we started to talk about at the beginning, we are motivated more so by the avoidance of pain. Yeah, well, we have to be. I mean, that's a survival technique. However, I think we have to engage the uh, executive function of the prefrontal cortex and get going with that because uh, we can get so reactive and, and re-traumatized. And that becomes, that's where people get suicidal and they become chronically ill. And so I think it's everybody's in everybody's best interest to meditate for themselves and, of course, to create peace on this planet, which I'm into um, <laughs> that's my main thing here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Peace. And my new, my new favorite thing is the Thich Nhat Hanh, peace in oneself, peace in the world. Like I can't get enough of sending that out and putting it on Instagram and just sharing that with people. It's just like, just chill out with all your intense opinions and just, you gotta, you gotta find that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I've got to tell you what the turning point for me being a teacher was. There are a couple of turning points, but um, you know, I was really upset at, even though I'm a meditator, I would get over it quickly, but I could find myself really getting upset at the lack of peace on this planet. And so what ended up happening is um, I read a poem by an ancient philosopher, Lao Tzu, and it was, he wrote the Tao Te Ching or came up with that. And Lao Tzu said, in order to have peace in the world, there must be peace between nations. In order to have peace between nations, there must be peace in the cities. In order to have peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. In order to have peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. In order to have peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. So just like you said, Corinne, that was an instantaneous wake-up call. I mean, I knew it. 
but I really wanted people to behave out there. I wanted people to love each other. I wanted people to care about this world and care about peace. And I, all I saw was strife and it would render me almost useless. Mm -hmm. And um, then I realized, wait a minute, it's my responsibility and maybe I can teach what I've learned. I started teaching in 1993, but I um, got more serious about it after I'd gone through the Chopra Center and worked with all these other people and then started really expanding the way I teach from beyond just one technique. And so I opened up a meditation center in 2006 and then opened up my teacher academy in 2011 because people were saying, well, I want, I want to be able to teach this to people. I'm like, well, I had to come face to face with, well, who am I? Why don't you go to Deepak Chopra or why don't you go to MBSR, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction? Why don't you go to a monastery? And then all of a sudden one day I said, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm going to teach it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to teach what I've been teaching for years and what I've been practicing for years and um, teach people how to do that. So that's what I've been doing ever since. And thank goodness you do it so, so yeah. well. I mean, Sarah, I, t I say this all the time to you, but I can share yeah. it with everybody listening. And Sarah has a gift for curriculum uh, beyond anything, uh, certainly that I can do and, and even courses I've taken. And um, your meditation teacher training is just so comprehensive. And then your mindfulness in the workplace program, like any of your training programs are just the highest integrity and, uh, and, and help people just to be fully confident in what they're learning so that they can become great teachers. So you, so thank you for, you know, doing that because I'm happy to have, you know, somewhere to send people that, that yeah. have that passion within. You know, I just want the end of suffering. And the thing is, I was such a, I was a little girl who was really suffering. I mm. really, really was. And anytime someone outside me was suffering, or I thought they were, it really like, you know, you're a musician, you know, if, if you hit a crystal bowl, not hit, if you sound a crystal mm -hmm. bowl, your guitar strings are going to vibrate over there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what would happen to me. Someone would be suffering and I could feel it so deeply and, I just wanted that to end for me and them. And it was touching me so deeply. And that it's happening now when I hear about people giving up on their lives and giving up on their families and giving up on, you know, this, this earth, you know, it's really, it doesn't, it's not as uh, resonant for me because I'm not suffering anymore. Really. I still have some areas in my life that I suffer, but not really, not like, not like I used to. And, I just want to end the suffering that people are dealing with so uh, that people can find home and peace at home. <laughs> yeah. And that's a, that's a great analogy for, you know, we, we, we have discussed uh, either, you know, symptoms or consequences or byproducts of meditation uh, seems to be empathy. Empathy seems to be one of the byproducts of um, meditation. The, the, the more you become connected within, within yourself, the more connected you become with the surrounding areas and it's it's a it's a good thing but it can be jarring to have that connectedness you know when you start to awaken to that um that connectedness you have that empathetic resonance between people and and you do take on other people's suffering and you 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 can't help but see it because you you see more now you're becoming more aware of that and Empathy can turn dysfunctional very quickly, and um, and, and that I think that was conf that was a confusing part part of my journey was, but I'm doing a good thing. I'm being empathetic. It's good to be empathetic, right? That's what we want in the world. We do want that, but like like from your example is I I was not admitting when I needed something or when I needed time for myself and when I needed to really commit to that practice because I was willing to give up my time and energy for just about anybody else and for their suffering. And so it, it, it is a natural byproduct of it. Just keep meditating. Don't stop meditating because you're having a dysfunctional empathy reaction, but <laughs> You know, it's right. It's, it is hard. And that is that that is that labyrinth that you're talking about. You know, you get into those modes sometimes mm -hmm. and um, stay the course, you know, st stay listening within. And, you know, that's yeah. very, very, very important to do. I like I like to quote um, 
Lucille Ball, because it reminded me of what you were just saying. She's, I don't know if you remember, I love Lucy, but. Oh, I do. Yeah. Yeah. She, she said, love yourself first and everything else will fall into place. Mm. And it's just like those flight attendants say, put your oxygen mask on first before you yeah. try to save everybody else. I'm like you, you know, I've really, I, for years, because of the upbringing I had, I was always outsourcing my sense of security and self. And so I had to come on back and resource it in here. And, um, you know, that's what you're talking about. If you want to help someone, you have to really be able to be that solid place to land in some Mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Yeah. And recover quickly from it. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. That's what it gives us. Well, Sarah, I know we could, we could continue on, but I think we've talked your ear off enough and thank you so much for sharing. Is there anything else you want to, I know you've got the mindfulness training, um, mindful and happy training coming up with Christine again, that starts tomorrow. And that starts usually every what, six weeks or something you have that. Yeah. Program. Every couple of months it does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's um, I just want, I just want you to, whoever is listening to this, I really encourage you to give meditation a try, whatever your beliefs about it, whether you think it's for you or not, or you think you have what it takes or not. I really invite you to, to give it a, a another shot. Um, it only works if you do it, not if you hear podcasts about it and no one can do it for you. You know, you're the one in charge of your own attention and meditation will only help you be better at that. And whatever you're seeking, whether it's more peace or comfort or happiness or health, or love, you'll get it with meditation. I can guarantee it. I can guarantee it. So, and there's a money back guarantee. (laughs) 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 Um, But anyway, I do. And and don't think there's only one way to do it. You know, there's a different type of meditation that some, I will go around the room for my mindful mindfulness and meditation teacher training. And I'll ask, you know, 30 people what their go-to meditation is. And I will get probably 15 different answers. You know, some people will say mindfulness, mantra, loving kindness, gratitude, walking meditations, visualizations, you know. Um, so there's not one size fits all. There's not one right way to do it. There's only the, the one you do is the right one for you. That's it. And you don't need anything other than those three ingredients. You do need good instruction. So I have a good YouTube channel. I don't know if you want to check it out, but... My last name is McLean, M-C-L-E-A-N, and you can go to McLean Meditation. And I've brought together a lot of nice meditations, not just from me, but from other teachers that will really help you get started. And at some point, hopefully you won't need any of us. You can just sit in your room by yourself and do it and it'll be yummy. (laughs) Well, Sarah, you are a lovely and powerful lady and you are a pro at being yourself. And thank you very much for, uh, you know, joining us today and giving us your time. That was, that was, it felt like a little mini, uh, meditation course, to be honest. I, okay. I feel like I got to go work on some shit. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, the more you talk about meditation, you may be noticing if listeners out there, um, it does change sort of your brainwave coherence, just talking yeah. about the stuff that most people are not talking about. They're talking about other stuff. If you put your attention on this, you'll notice that it will change your physiology. So good luck. And thank you, Corinne. Thank you so much, Sean. And I will just see you next time, I guess. Next time. Absolutely. Love you, Sarah. Thanks, thank man. you. Thank you so much. Take care. Welcome to the Say More section, my favorite section outside of the interviews. Although now I'm realizing that maybe I shouldn't call the Say More section my favorite time because that's a little degrading to the conversation. That's not cool. It's all good. It's all good. (laughs) I always say when people say, oh my gosh, this is the best meal I've ever had. I always say, you know why it's the best meal you've ever had? Because you've just had it. So whatever (laughs) you're doing in the moment is your favorite, favorite thing. Yes. So Sarah has been a a friend of mine for almost uh, 25 years. And uh, she, I met her through Deepak Chopra. We both worked for him at different times, but I was studying there when, when she was working there. And um, she is the most like, she's so well-spoken. It was interesting in the interview that she said she used to be shy and yeah. did not feel comfortable speaking. I didn't know that about her. Well, I laughed when she said that. Cause I'm like, you're crushing it right now. And you've been a teacher of meditation for years. It's hard to believe, but, but again, you know, that, that kind of points to the roadblocks that, uh, you know, she said she had personally, and, you know, Mm -hmm. we've, we've discussed these, these traumas, these roadblocks, this programming, whatever you want to call it, these, these points 
in your beingness that stop you from you know becoming your true self or uh, animating your true self, they make you believe you're not good at something, like you're not good at you know public speaking. When in truth, she's fantastic. She's pro. Uh, everything was fluid. I was actually making fun of myself, you know, in between the conversation because I, you know, I'm always, I'm always looking for. Well, I'm looking for my brain to s- slow down first off, and I'm always stumbling over the excitement about the fact that I'm even saying anything, right? I'm kind of always living in that. And being listened to. <laughs> and being listened to, right? It's like, <gasps> attention. It's so great. I get crazy, you know, and it's, and I am in that, but I, I am, I'm also just very excited about having these conversations because I, I think I grew up in a culture uh, even into my adulthood where I didn't have a lot of people to have these conversations and just, you know, just go down the the rabbit hole of m- m- any mysticism, you know, anything like, let's just talk about it. We're, we're, we're caught up in our biases about things. And, um, I love the way Sarah broke down, you know, a f- how to, how to look at meditation at the core truth of it all and, and not be caught up in, the how you're meditating or what you're using to meditate. Um, You know, I imagine that a lot of her power as a teacher comes from being able to accept all those, you know, variations. She's not, she's not saying don't have those, but don't put your awareness or your focus on the way or how you're meditating, put it on the meditation. And you know what? I, I, yes, I love, I totally agree. I love that about her, that she's so accepting of all paths. Um, I think that's a, it's um, what's one of the things that makes her such a, a great teacher of teachers. And um, what I always tell people though, when, when people, cause people will come to me as a meditation t- teacher and be like, well, how do I know what is the best technique for me? There's, you know, where do I start? There's like mindfulness and, and breathing. And Locera went through the, the gambit. There's the chakra and the visualization. Like, how do I know where to start? Or how do I know if the meditation technique I'm doing is working for me? Right. So what I tell people, because I had a priest years ago, years ago, I was, you know, I was the only person teaching the Chopra meditation technique in Nashville. And this priest called up uh, House of Bliss, the meditation center that I had. And he said, I want to get a mantra and learn the the primordial sound, the Deepak Chopra technique. And I said, okay, is there a reason? I said, are you already meditating? And Because he, he said, I've, I've already got a meditation practice. I'm like, well, why do you want the mantra? Well, I just read about it and I thought it would be, you know, it'll probably be better than what I'm doing. And I said, well, my question to you is, are you happy with the way your life is going and where you are at spiritually and personal growth wise? Like, do you see, are you happy? Are you at peace? Uh, do you, and he said, yes. And I'm like, well, then you don't need another meditation technique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause that's why we come to meditation is because we are searching, searching, we're seeking, we're in pain, either emotionally or physically. We're unsure uh, about our path. We're uh, a- anxious, whatever the thing is that people come to meditation for. Um, but if you have a practice already and you're thinking about trying something else, you just, you just, that's how you tell your meditation technique is working or not is, is, are you, are you happy with your personal growth, with your daily, uh, inner peace with your, you know, if you're not, then you need a meditation practice and that's probably most people need one. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and that's, that's what I think is, is so, you know, what was, what I really enjoyed about the, the conversation was how non-judgmental or how neutral it was about, whatever practice because you do have to start somewhere and and that somewhere will draw you to it you know that starting point will draw you to it 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 will start with questioning as it seems with most people there's this you know for sarah it was i i I just i felt out of place that you know something more you know there was a, a a mystical thing calling from the ether saying you know look look deeper look more you know and at the time she sounds like she struggled to articulate that and that turned into rebellion. And, and I think, and I think that was a similar experience for me was there was a rigidity to how to live life, but not the answer or or the, uh, or something given to me to make me understand why I need to live life that way. And, and, 
and I couldn't articulate that as a kid, it's even into my you know high school. I, I didn't understand why. All I knew was this isn't working for me, and you know I I think I think what's what's important and what is kind of fascinating is going beyond uh, the teacher, the guru, because we we started talking about. Um, Buddha, uh, you know, and what that means is, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I lost my, I couldn't remember exactly what you said. I wanted to take a note and I didn't, but, um, Buddha is the internal self, your, your Buddha nature, Buddha nature. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of, it spun off this train of thought about, and what you say, uh, the guru means one who points at the light. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, What's funny is there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different gurus. There's a lot of different teachers that point to the light. And it seems like we get hung up on the thing that is pointing to the light <laughs> when, and we focus on that, you know, and I think I, I've shifted. Uh, I, I know it kind of might seem like I slam Christianity in a lot of ways in a lot of these podcasts. And I, I really don't because I believe that Christ was, a pointer of the light. I believed he was, uh, you know, he seems pretty freaking enlightened. You know, I didn't meet him in real time back, you know, 2000 years ago, but I'm, I'm comfortable, not that it matters to anybody else, but I'm comfortable with the teachings of Christ. I think they're very in line with a lot of the, um, the teachings of self-realization on, on a whole. And I think what happens is people are fixated on that pointer of, of the light to the degree that when you are looking at a different guru pointing at the light, well, that's not my, that's not my guru pointing at the light. That's a different guru. That can't be the right way because I'm looking at the thing that's pointing to the light. And what I think we need to really, you know, uh, anchor to, and this is, Sarah seems to embody this, is there are many things that point to the light. Meditation shifts your focus to the light, <laughs> you know, and that, that is when I think things really start to get interesting in the self, uh, inquiry journey, the spiritual journey, but it also gets very convoluted because you're kind of living this dual life of like, well, I'm looking at the light, but I'm also looking at life and holy shit, are these things out of sync, you know, and it's it, it, patience, forgiveness, you know. Yeah, well, there's many layers. I mean, I think uh, one of the first things that happens when you start to meditate is you notice how many thoughts, how many crazy thoughts you are, you you have, and and what, and that's actually an important aspect of meditation yeah. is to notice who you're not, basically all the thoughts and all the emotions, you know, and that's a, one of the reasons why people stay away from meditation. Um, or they don't like it because they don't want to be with their thoughts, but they're with their thoughts all the time anywhere. They're just distracted by other things. Yes. You know, so yeah, Sarah, Sarah just articulates it all so beautifully. Um, and she came, but she came to it, you know, honestly, it was her journey first. That's the thing is, yeah. you know, great, especially teachers of this, you know, self inquiry, self realization, enlightenment type of thing. It, it's great when, that's why I love learning about their stories about how they found it for themselves. Yes. You know, that was what's all, what always inspired me is I read, I was fascinated what all the autobiographies when I was young did. Of course, when I was young, it wasn't spiritual autobiographies. It was, um, although Shirley MacLaine was the first one that I read that was spiritual. I read that in like, I think I was 20 or 21. But before that, it was like Willie Nelson and um, Carol Burnett and Sammy Davis Jr., um, it, uh, these people, because I love to see the journeys and the turning points that brought them to the point where they are. And it's like, how many, how many miracles do we need to be able to see how perfect <laughs> our journey is, right? Oh, fucking all hell, the, yeah. All exactly. the dips and doodles yeah. and potholes and stuff are all just to help us it's like, it's like honing the diamond, you know, it's like yeah. specifically given to us. And Sarah's journey was that, you know, it was perfect. All the little turning points for her along the way. And, you know, you and I talk about ours all the time. It's, it's, 
it's unfathomable how divinely perfect it is. Yeah. It, very well said. Very well put. And and it's funny how an Audel biography is a very deep introspection and self-reflection. I mean, it, it's almost like by reading autobiography autobiographies you know when you were younger it's like it's like hello this is what you should do is self-reflect you know that's what was drawing you to it and 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 that's what I that's what I really love are you know these little gravity points these points of grace that kind of just fall on us I love I love that a medita a teacher of meditation teaching her first meditation experience was in the army outside of a, you know, psych ward on the grass with some rando that she, I don't know, I don't catch if she knew him or not, but like 10 minutes of laying in the grass and having somebody, you know, do a body scan. That was her first, you know, little. Um, oh, other than the pyramid when she was. Younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was the first one. And then like, yeah, the pyramid too. But I mean, these little moments of grace and, you know, I, I don't, re I don't like to, or no, even know how to articulate the nature of God. That, that's, that's a long, long conversation. But what I, what I do know is, is those moments point to a higher power, a higher consciousness, a higher awareness, something meddling in your experience that guides you to a, a path that is designed for you, that we are actually hellbent on not walking. We are, we are, we are designed, well, we are designed and our programming is designed to keep us off that path. And, and, and I love, I've loved hearing everybody. It's like, what made you do take that? I have no idea. I, I couldn't, it was at the time it was the thing to do and it was a challenge, but I listened and I trusted. And sorry, were you finished? That no, thought? Okay. never okay. finished with a thought. Before. <laughs> <laughs> what was interesting is I think about the, the, um, the word that the um, fear of missing out mm. and that is really prevalent in the younger culture. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I try to find the word, like when you meditate, you, you have this pull of gravity that we've been talking about that it's unmistakable to go there. And I think when they, they don't, these young people aren't meditating, they're on their devices all the time, they're not really in tune with that pull, then they see all the choices and they don't know which choice to make. And, they, and, they're, and they're, the fear of missing out is like, well, if I choose that one, maybe that's a better way to go. And I must say, you know, I was fortunate enough to find the meditation when I was like 26 um, that wasn't part of my conversation at all. I mean, maybe I worded it differently, but the conversation in my head, although I must say when I first moved to Nashville before I started meditating, it wasn't that I had so many choices. It was that if I don't go to that music business party, I might not meet the person like mm -hmm. to get ahead. Yeah. So I guess that's similar to what that, but that went away as soon as I started meditating is I just knew the pull and there wasn't even another choice because I knew that I can re-choose again. That's some of the coaching I do. I've got, I've got a friend of mine who calls me up uh, sometimes a, a young friend, younger friend. Um, and she has a really hard time making decisions right now. She's trying to find, figure out where she can, where she and her daughter are going to live. And she's been living in the same place for 14 years. So she's like, for months and months, she's trying to find the exact perfect place. And every time she set, finds a really good place, she like, mulls it over in her head and does the pros and cons so much that the place is gone. Yeah. You know, and it's that, and I was just like, you got to get back to your meditation girl because you will know. And so I try to say, just sit down, think about making that decision and how does that feel in your body? And then think about not making like, if that place is gone tomorrow, yeah. how does your body feel? You know? So that's, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and my, my wife struggles with that. Uh, Meg, as you know, you know, she, she struggles to a degree of 
indecision, <laughs> you know, because it, it, it feels like the end all be all. And if you're not used to adventuring into the unknown where it's like, well, I'm not going to know what's on the other end of this until I go through this. And I can't know. It's not that I won't know or I don't know. I cannot know what it's going to be like. But I think part of that that dysfunction comes from an attachment of, okay, when I make this decision, this decision has to be in line with my projection of the outcome. So I'm making a decision and it better be like I've pros and conned it, pro, pro and conned it, however you say that, <laughs> did the pros and cons for it. And I think that's why people are, are let down or to the, and even if they've done that, that pattern and then they know that it's, it's almost certainly not going to be the best place ever, but you forget to leave out. You can move again, or you could change your course again. You can do this as many times as you want. There's no rule that says this is the last decision you're ever going to make. And, and I think that's also, you know, I have, I have lived my life pretty free of that, though I have got caught up in decisions. I've, I've been the victim of myself in that, you know, regard too. Um, and yes, to your point, that's why meditation is so powerful because it will guide you to move when your when your intellect and your discerning mind can't find cohesion. That's it, oh, that's that's a good one. It, it will. Mm -hmm. sure it will is. certainly, and and usually it will tell you to move at the moment of most discomfort and the moment of most indecision. Um, and and that's you know I'm literally in the studio. That was that experience. I waited and I calculated and I, I don't know, the money and I don't have the money right now and I don't know if I should. And it's like, no, this is the path. You're going to build this thing. So commit to that and then start designing it. And as soon as I did, the money, the opportunity came for the money. Mm -hmm. Everything lined up. And, and it's like, oh, it was then easy. No. Uh, no, this shit was hard. I built everything from the ground up and it was a long, arduous process of endless hours and it was very uncomfortable to get through, but it didn't feel uncomfortable because it was, it, it was something that I, I was in line with myself with. It was in, I was in line with mm -hmm. that higher gravity drawing me through that process that is an amazing point, alignment with yourself. Do you know how many people, I remember uh, this was sitting on the rooftop with Werner in India and there was this, um, this young man from Germany and he, and he has a question for Werner and he says, I want to quit smoking and Werner says, okay. <laughs> and he says, but I really like smoking. And Werner's like, Okay. And he says, but I really think I should quit smoking. <laughs> and this is the debate that people have yeah. in their heads all the time about everything and, and alignment. And so Werner said, you just quit or you don't. It doesn't, doesn't, you just do it or you don't do it. This is, but he pointed out, this is the debate that people have in their heads. And, and they say that about smoking. They say, once you decide it's, it's, you know, it's, it's supposed to be one of the hardest things to, to do for people, but it's because they have that debate. They're not committed yeah. to that. Yeah. And so to be meditation for me has helped me to be aligned mind, body, spirit. That's what it means to know yourself, to know that inner dialogue and to know, are you, are you believing that it's like, it's like you have a roommate. Um, Michael Singer says that in the untethered soul. He says, <laughs> it's like you have a roommate inside your head. It's like, even when you, when you're waking up in the morning, it's like, um, oh, my body feels good today. Maybe I'll um, skip my workout. And there's like, and the other voice is like, no, 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 you have to do your workout. Okay, well, I'm going to get up and brush my teeth and then I'll decide. And it's like, this is all the time, every all day, this roommate. And you think this is gospel in here. Like you're constantly yeah. listening yeah. to it. And if you had somebody outside of your head that was saying all the things that were inside your head, you wouldn't pay attention to them. You're like, you're 
crazy. Yes. It's crazy yeah. talk, you know, <laughs> yeah. but we listen to this. And so, so the, the self-inquiry journey, the meditation journey is all about knowing yourself. And people say, well, I, I know myself. I've been with myself, but most people don't know themselves. That's why they can't sit to meditate. They don't know that there's an inner dialogue all the time. They don't know that they have beliefs, absolutes, belief systems within themselves that I am pretty or not pretty or sexy or not sexy, yeah. or I'm a good learner or not a good learner, or I'm a good daughter, a good wife, a good mother, or not a good wife, a good mother. It's like, there's all these labels we have on ourselves Yes, and that, that Sarah was explaining so beautifully about how that dropped away. And that's what happens along the, the self-inquiry, knowing yourself meditation journey. You, you are alone with yourself. So you get to know that inner roommate and eventually the inner roommate does doesn't ever fucking shut up. <laughs> Never. But you learn to ignore the roommate. Yes. You know? Yeah. I, exa that's exactly. Yeah. A, a, very well put. And God is usually the presence or consciousness or whatever word you have for it internally that is laughing at you during that debating process or smiling at you or for for me, it's it's the one that when I'm in that you know indecision, and and there's there's the calling, the gravity calling that says you should do this now. It's like, hey, motherfucker, who asked you? <laughs> you know, it's like we're debating this. Who asked you? It's like, okay, I'll be here when you're ready to listen. That's that's for me, you know that, and it's it's it's. I say God, but it's like this higher self-consciousness. That's the interaction I have with that. Yeah, there's there, it's a still small voice. You can call it God. Yes. You can call it consciousness. You can call it spirit. You can call it inner flow. Yeah. Um, you know, whatever it is. And it feels different for everybody. You know, yes. you might hear it as a voice. Um, I have heard that voice at times, but for me, it's just more of a pull, a feeling. Yeah. You know, it's more, and, and, and with all the meditation, it's like this still awareness that's behind my eyes that's guiding yeah. me, you know, but everybody experiences it differently and, and you experience it differently at different points along your journey. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's a misconception that you, you're waiting for that voice to become louder and that voice is waiting for you to shut up. Like, <laughs> That's really what's going on. <laughs> That's, That's the relationship. Awesome, Sean. <laughs> but and 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 there's plenty of memes. There's plenty of you know uh, hyperbole and you know little metaphors in spiritual practice that talk about that. It's like, you know, I want this. 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 You know, it's like, well, are are you listening for the instructions on how to get to that? And and. and and that's, that's one of my biggest hang up is, you know, and what's fun for me now, and I don't know if this is going to be the way I continue to be, but this is what's fun for me right now is that play of like, it, of really inviting that silent, still voice into the conversation more. And, and what's, what's fascinating is that this, that very subtle energy never gets any more than than that subtle that subtle nature it's it's never trying to argue for space it's never trying to coerce you it's never trying to for me at least it's it's always still and it's always waiting for me and my attention and and that is the most powerful thing that I've discovered about meditation is it puts me in that listening state. It puts me in a state of, of looking at, okay, this is my programming. This is my untruth. This is all my untruths. I'm not any of these things. I don't need this. I don't need that. Like I don't need to focus on that because when I have focused on these things in the past, it throws me off from that relationship uh, with that gravity. So logic would tell you, then do the things that keep you in the relationship with that subtle uh, internal higher self, you know, relationship. It's beautiful. So it, do you... Do it you, really is. Yeah. Right. Do you find... 
Um, so that's what you're doing in meditation. And then do you find it's happening more um, during the day that you're aware of that stillness within you? So I think what I've, I think meditation, my morning meditation routine prepares me for being more present and aware of that decision throughout the day. So, you know, in meditation, that's, that's bringing myself into that awareness, having that experience of I am that I am, I'm, I'm, I'm present in that space. And I liked, I liked the way that Sarah put it where the, the, um, the subject and the object become one, you know, and that, that fusion of those two things. And I, I don't expect that to happen in meditation, but you know, the, my, my meditation practice, the symptom of which generally brings me, you know, with <laughs> not always in that core center, but you know, within that center and that having meditated in the morning, then when I'm in these situations where it's like, well, should I do this? Should I do this? It's like, you're doing it again. And then, oh, I don't want to live that way. And then again, you know, sometimes it's every five fucking minutes. Sometimes it's a few times a day, but you know, I've really tried, I've been really trying to bring that practice into my mixing. Um, when I'm mixing a song now, sometimes I will just do something. I'll EQ something or do, do an act because that is just something I would do without really focusing or listening to if the song even needs that. And, and when that happens, then I just, I just pause and I almost do like one or two. I just listen to the song top to bottom and really listen to whether or not the song actually needs what I was about to do. The first pass is, yeah, I do. I think it needs that or no, it doesn't need it. And the second pass is, well, what does it need? You know, and just that awareness of really listening and honing into the the music and staying in that space instead of, well, God, I really hope I'm making enough money on the song or, you know, is this song worth doing now? Is this my time? Instead of getting into that, the best thing I can do is focus on the task at hand. And the task at hand, no matter what my fucking brain wants to tell me, the task at hand is be aware and present and give this song what what presence of mind is asking you to do to this song. Yeah. So yeah. that's what the the meditation practice is infiltrating that, you know, everyday pr process. Beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's creating space. Um, yeah. I mean, presence and space, I think are very similar um, words. So you're bringing presence to your mixing, you're bringing space and, yeah. and listening um, rather than, yeah, like you said, being caught up in the, in the ego and the head and the, the roommate that debates yeah. everything within your being that you don't have to listen to, but it's, it's incessant. And, and that's, I think that's, it is incessant and it never goes away. Mm -hmm. And th the only thing that goes away is, is the attention you give to it, mm -hmm. you know, and that's all oh God, you know, you're in the, you're in a mix for six to eight hours. I can't tell you how many times my roommate tells me I'm a shitty mix engineer or I'm not as good as this person or this isn't going to sound this way or blah, you know, so many stories. The roommate has so many stories about things that may or may not true, may, may or may not be true, but what is for sure, none of those stories are actually going to serve the purpose of the task at hand. That is the distraction of the ego. That is the distraction of trying to deter you from the path that's going to serve you the most. Yeah. And that's yeah. just one example. That's yeah. just one yeah. example. Yeah. So Beautiful. Well, we could talk about this specific <laughs> topic all day because... All day. Yeah. But, the, and that's, you know, a, a great conversation, wonderful affirmations, but also this one was unique. It, it was a it was a wonderful challenge. I felt I felt challenged to really dive deeper into my meditation practice. You know, there was almost her her presence as a meditation teacher teacher. Um, you know, almost had this air of you know, are you are you really involved in your practice to the degree that you need to be to serve your 
purpose. And I was like, no, I could be, I could do better, you know? And again, it wasn't judgmental, but I felt that the whole time. It was just like, it's a call to do something that, like she said, is guaranteed to be good for you. And that's a beautiful, beautiful calling, you know, for her is to be a light for something that is unarguably healthy and good for you no matter what, no matter what situation is. Meditation is good for you. So, yeah. Thank so, you, sir. So, no, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, people. sir, Sarah. And thank you, Sean. And subscribe if you have, if there's still people listening, <laughs> make sure if you like, if you're still listening, you obviously want to subscribe because you made it until the end. So subscribe and then you'll get notifications as to when we have stuff come out. And then that yeah. helps us too. Yeah. I imagine the only people that are still listening are the ones who have already subscribed. So thank you for subscribing already. <laughs> until next time, this has been a great conversation on Turning Points Podcast. I love you. Thank you for all the things you're doing in the background. And I'll see you next week. Love ya. Bye.